Good morning. Today we continue the um, series on uh, serving Jesus Christ as one of the main purposes of our lives. So we spent a couple of weeks on our gifts, our abilities, um, the things that God has given us in this life. In fact, whether we notice or not, whether we uh, worship God or not, everything we have in terms of our mental ability, in terms of our physical ability, in terms of any kind of gifts and talents that we have come from God. Um, now what we choose to do with it is up to us. And so Jesus Christ has called us to use it to serve him and to serve others. Um, that is the one simple thing you can remember with Jesus Christ. What is the purpose? Uh, what is everything that he wants us to do? Just to love God and to love others. And so in loving, we serve. And so this is uh, Jesus' game plan. I just wanted to um, uh, remind you of what the plan is uh, that Jesus has set for this, our church, um, our church, his church, um, and what our purpose here. And so Jesus Christ gives the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teacher. He calls them. He trains them. He equips them. And then all of us, everyone in the church, um, our job is to do the works of service based on our spiritual gifts, our heart, our abilities, where our passions are, our personalities, our different experiences, and where we come from. Use all of that um, to build up the, uh, the church that God has given us so that in this world, the purpose of the church will be achieved, which is to go and make followers of Jesus Christ, the Bible calls it disciples, baptizing them, and then teaching them everything that God has taught us from the Bible. And so today we're going to focus today and next week we're going to focus on uh, the heart of a servant and the mind of a servant, how servants act, um, uh, what their heart is, and how servants uh, think. And so first I want to start off with a differentiator. Um, something that is different. And so I want you to uh, compare and contrast how this world views greatness. And while I was doing this yesterday, I actually Googled who is the most powerful person on earth. And actually, the, this, uh, the, um, I'm not showing it in the slideshow, but the, uh, the hits that you get, the responses are pretty interesting. It's not what I thought at all. But I want to tell you that this world defines great people and uh, greatness in terms of four things um, that's listed in the book. Power. The more power you have, in fact, um, some people actually have the title of the most powerful man in, uh, you know, in the world um, or the richest person in the world. But power and possession, how much stuff you got, how much money you have. Um, that's why you can typically Google, you know, how much is so-and-so worth, um, because people measure it in possessions, how much money you have. So power, possession, prestige, how honorable you are. Some people don't have a lot of money. Some people don't have a lot of power, but especially people in the medical field, in the, um, you know, in the field of the sciences, um, they are very prestigious. Um, so prestige, honor, and then position, what position you're in in life, in society, um, in general, in people's hearts and minds. So the four P's, power, possessions, prestige, and position. And most people measure how successful you are or how high up you are by how many people uh, serve you. But Jesus Christ is different. He measures greatness by how many people you serve. So get that difference. It's not how many people that serve you that makes you great. It's how many people you serve that makes you great. And Jesus Christ himself has set an example for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And one of the great things that I love about the songs that the song that we just sang, and by the way, that's pretty good uh, for putting it all together after the volleyball tournament or not uh, this, this morning. But one of the great things that I like about the Bob Hartman songs, which is from Petra, the band in the 80s, is that uh, they created music to, um, and they took everything that was popular in the world so that people can relate to it, and they used it to worship God. And so you notice lyrics like, the fairest of all, your excellency, they put that in the song to worship God. Um, our Jesus is worthy of worship, and he, he is actually very, um, he's a, an innovator, 
He's a revolutionary uh, person. He changes everything in this world. And one of the things that is revolutionary about Jesus Christ is that he himself is a God above all gods. He is the creator of the universe. He is strong and mighty and all-powerful, yet he chose to become a servant and do the work of a servant. So I put here uh, someone pouring water because uh, it's an image of Jesus Christ washing his disciples' feet. In those days, only the servants in the house washed anybody's feet or actually like um, fetched water for anybody in the household. And so Jesus Christ, after eating with his disciples, went around, washed each of their feet. And in addition to that, he played with children. At my house, um, Mendak is the baby of the family, and so in the summer, I, although I work from home, I have to work. So I have a schedule of who has to watch baby from like one to two, and then two o'clock, there's a change in shift, and uh, another kid takes over to watch baby. And I'm pretty sure baby has escaped on somebody's watch, at least twice in the past two weeks. Um, bad watching. But when people said, oh, kids, get away from the Lord teacher, Jesus Christ, Jesus said, no, let the children come to me. And he sat them on his lap, and he blessed each one of them. And so Jesus uh, uh, played with kids. And what else did Jesus do? This might um, be a surprise to you, but Jesus Christ cleaned fish. Now, who can think of a situation where Jesus Christ cleaned fish? Just shout it out. When did Jesus clean fish? Was that ever in the Bible? Yeah, John Key can't think of it. If John Key can't think of it, who can think of it? Oh, remember after Jesus Christ was crucified, the disciples said, hey, man, I don't know. I don't know about this. Let's all just go back to what we used to do. So they all went fishing because they were all fishermen. So they went fishing, and they fished all night, and they caught zero, nothing. They were all tired. They were worn out. They were extremely discouraged. Not only did Jesus Christ die, uh, their teacher, their master that they've been following for three years died. Now they can't catch anything. They can't even go back to, to fishing, uh, which is what they did for a living, which is what they excelled at. And now they can't even catch one single fish. They came ashore, and Jesus Christ was there, and he made breakfast. He had already cleaned the fish, cooked the fish, and what did he say? He said, come, eat. And if I was just choose to think about Jesus Christ, I would think that he's a five-star Michelin chef. And so you cannot eat fish that has not been cleaned, no matter how well you cooked it. So Jesus Christ would have had to clean the fish, right, before he cooked it and said, come and eat. And so very, very menial tasks, very small things like that, very lowly things, our Jesus Christ did it. And so that's why I say our, uh, our God is truly an awesome God in that he's revolutionary. He doesn't fit into the mold of this world and what the world tells you is greatness. He sets his own standards for greatness. And it's important that we understand this standard because if we don't, even in churches, and I spoke to some pastors over the years, um, even in churches, they, you know, fight for power within the church. Um, they really don't have the heart of a true servant. And so it causes problems. And so uh, Jesus Christ made it very clear. You can use your shape. You can understand your abilities. You can serve God. You can do many things in the name of Jesus Christ. But if you do not have the right heart of a servant, the heart of Jesus Christ, what will happen in the end? Jesus Christ said that on the day of judgment, there will be people who come to him and said, Jesus, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your names? Did we not lay hands on the sick and heal them in your name? Did we not perform great miracles? And I thought about that. I said, if they were fake prophets, how can they really cast out demons and heal the sick? They were real prophets. They were real uh, people of the Lord. But yet what? They did all those things with the wrong heart with the wrong intentions, for the wrong purpose. That's why I feel it's very important that you understand what, is, uh, what, the, what the message is today so that we don't become a serving church but lacking the heart of Jesus Christ and the mind of Jesus Christ. And so knowing your shape, developing your ability, serving God, all that is great, but if we do not have the right heart, the heart of a servant, it ultimately ends up that we... Uh, become self-centered. 
We become focused on what we've been able to do, how great we've been able to do it, and uh, all those other things that just centers on us and not on Jesus Christ, which defeats the whole purpose. Um, and so uh, that's what I want you to understand about how important it is to have the heart of a servant. And so, uh, and in the book, you'll find he says a very, very um, important point. He said, some people, it is possible to serve a lifetime without ever being a servant because a true servant has the heart of Jesus Christ, the heart of a uh, of a servant of God. So this morning, I'm going to go over six things, and I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. I'll send out the link if you guys want to listen to the chapter, and I encourage you to listen to the chapter because I cut out a lot of details to make it uh, fit into a, a, more, a Sunday morning service. But six things are what the heart of a servant should have. And if you don't have them, it's fine. Now you know, and you can uh, focus on having these things, thinking about these things, um, developing these things in your heart. It's not just the work that you do, it's what goes on inside also, because God sees it. All right, first, make yourself available for serving. What does this mean? Uh, it means do not fill up your time, because then you will be unavailable. Um, and this is what I have experienced, uh, and I share this with you probably over the course uh, in the, the past couple years, different things. I told you that I wanted to, um, uh, you know, serve God ever since I was a teenager. Um, and so uh, when I got to college, I did not know any pharmacists. I did not know, uh, I was not sick, so I've never had a prescription medication ever. And so in my first year of pharmacy school, I thought I'd better get some real life experience. So I went to uh, work for a drugstore. And then I found out, dang it, they all work on weekends. There are no drugstores that are closed on Saturdays and Sundays. And if I want to keep on serving God, I'm going to have to find something to do about that. And so that's the reason why I explored all kinds of different areas of pharmacy. And I don't know if I told you, but I worked in the nuclear pharmacy because they closed on Saturday and Sunday. And I gained a lot of very good experiences um, about radiation and about um, all different kinds of areas of pharmacy. And, um, and if I haven't described it to you before, when I worked in the nuclear pharmacy, we had to wear these lead coats, these lead vests, and I worked behind these like two inch lead glass, and I stuck my hands in these lead um, uh, uh, gloves, and I pulled up these radioactive uh, syringes, and we put it in these lead containers, and the guys that deliver it had to put it in these lead containers, and all of it um, weighed like 20 pounds each, and these guys, I've never seen such butch pharmacy techs in my life. You can go to the pharmacy and see them. They're usually like girls or something. But these guys were tatted up. They were like big, huge, because why? Because they carried like six of those containers at the same time. So that's 20, 40, 60, 80. Um, I mean, 40, the bigger guys can carry more. But at least 80 pounds each. They would carry it out to the truck, load it up, and then deliver it to the hospitals. And so, uh, I, I, I went and I looked and I looked everywhere for all kinds of pharmacy uh, that did not work on Saturdays. And I could not go into radio, um, into nuclear pharmacy. So when I graduated, uh, I had to stay in retail and I picked the night shift. So for months, I slept in the closet um, because when you work the night shift, and like I mentioned, when we studied about your body, um, when you work the night shift, you want to replicate sleeping at night as much as possible. So when I came home, I worked all night. I came home at 7 a.m. I went in the closet. I shut all the doors so it would be completely dark, just as if it was night. And I slept in the closet for months until I found a job that was Monday through Friday and did not work weekends. If you really want to serve God, you make yourself available. You arrange your life to make yourself available to serve God. And so do not just let where the chips fall, uh, you know, your work, your activities, or whatever. And then if you have time left, then, oh, okay, maybe I will serve Lord with that amount of time. That is not how servants, um, uh, that is not the heart of a servant. You make yourself available. And the second thing is you make yourself available in the moment. Um, in the book, you'll see that uh, God, uh, you know, can mess up your plans for the day uh, just like that. 
um, but can, will you be resentful for it? Sometimes he brings situation right into your life, right at that moment. And so uh, remind yourself every morning that uh, there are no disruptions. There are really appointments that God brings into your life. And when God brings into your life a need, God brings into your life an opportunity, will you take it or will you see it as a disruption to your schedule for that day? And so make yourself available to serve. And then second, pay attention to needs. Pay attention to needs um, or the other way that you can notice needs are when things go wrong because things fell through the crack because no one was there to take care of it. So pay attention to needs. And I know a lot of people actually pay attention to details to what? To criticize, to say, oh, that went wrong. Oh, that went so wrong. Oh, that was horrible. Oh, that was bad. But as a servant and with the heart of a servant, when you see a need that was unfulfilled, that there was a gap, that is your calling. That is your place to fill in the gap. And so in the book, you'll see that, you know, your shape, is, um, is your abilities, what you excel at, your experiences, but that is your primary ministry sometimes, but then God expects you to fill in a need anytime it's needed. And the example that uh, is in the book is if you, if you walk along and you see someone fall in the ditch, you can't say, hmm, I don't think I have the gift of mercy, at least not today, and then you walk past. Uh, Jesus told many stories, including the, the Good Samaritan, um, that if there is a need, God expects you to fulfill that need, and actually that is a test. And so that is a test of your heart, not of your ability. And so if there is a need, uh, take it, because God has allowed you to see that need. And there's two things about needs that I want you to understand. Good opportunities, great opportunities, do not last very long. Sometimes an, op uh, an open window will come up. You have one chance right that, at that moment, right in that person's moment of need to help them, to serve them. And sometimes these opportunities will never come again in your entire life. And so um, I encourage you to pay attention. Pay attention to people's needs. Do not be resentful when your days are disrupted, when something just drops on your lap because that is probably God's divine appointment for you to serve him. And so uh, look at it as an opportunity and begin by looking for a small task also within the church, within your family, within your workplace, within your school. Um, look for ways that you can serve by doing small things. Um, that's how everybody gets started in, in ministry, in serving others, um, because God's not going to give you something big if you have not done something small very well. And so, uh, number three, work with what they have. Uh, the heart of a servant, all servants work with what they have. And I tell you why this is important. Because what we tend to do is say that, well, when I have the money, or well, when I have more time in my life, well, when I've finished this, when I've done that, when I'm in a better place, better position in life, I'm going to do it when I get older. When you young kids get say, uh, you know, when I get older, when I get more experience, I'll serve God. When you're older, you're too busy. And say, when I have more time. And then when you retire, then you have more time, but then you're too weak and sick to serve God. You see how that goes? So don't say... Uh, this is not the right time, or I don't have what it takes, or that is just a lie uh, that Satan brings into your mind to stop you from serving God. And I tell you uh, something practical about the way I grew up and in my childhood. So we were poor. Let's just put it straight that way. We were not uh, well off. We did not have a lot of money. Um, and truly, I went to school in the hood. And so... Um, and so as first-generation immigrants, my mom, our parents did not speak the language, and my dad was a pastor. Uh, and then my mom worked at a, you know, just a, at a, you know, Levi Strauss, and before that, various uh, other manufacturing places. But my dad, uh, he, like our first house, we were in Ardmore, Oklahoma. The church sponsored us, so they, they got us a house to start us off, and in the house there was an attached garage. So we lived in the house, and then my dad sponsored people from refugee camps 
um, back when the immigrants were escaping from Vietnam and they were in refugee camps. He sponsored ref refugees and they lived in our garage. When we moved to Texas, um, the same thing. He was always helping somebody with what he had available. I remember there was this old, there was all kinds of people that lived in our house. There was this old lady who did not get along with her daughter-in-law. Her daughter-in-law got into arguments with her all the time, made her cry. They just could not get along. So my dad said, come, come live with us. Uh, and so we had this old lady in our house, and then there were um, another guy, uh, he, his brother, uh, they just came over from Vietnam too, his brother uh, and his wife couldn't get, long, couldn't get along with his younger brother. The younger brother ran away from home, so my dad said, come, come live at my house. So there we have this other guy, and then there's these other people, you know, um, one had uh, remarried and the, the kid didn't get along with the stepmom teenager again, he said, come come live with us. And so all throughout my childhood, we had various different people from refugee camps coming to live with us for three months, six months, just various different people living in our house. And so that was the kind of person my dad was. He did not wait till we had a better place to live. He did not wait till we had a bigger home. He did not wait for uh, more money to make more money. He did not wait for any of those things. He just worked with what he had to meet the needs of what he saw. And so that's what I want you to understand. Do not wait for a better time because Satan will make sure that better time will never come in your life. And so do uh, work with what you have uh, and do what you can. And so number four, do tasks with equal dedication. And so number three and number four kind of go together. Um, one of the things that stop people from serving God is that they're afraid that uh, they don't have what it takes to do it well. And then people are going to say, oh, you know, it was a poor job or whatever. But I tell you something, doing something is better than doing nothing. And so if you have good intentions that, oh, you know, when I can do a good job or when I have uh, more time and more, more things that I can commit to it and I can do it well, um, those good intentions are good, but it is still zero until you actually do something for the Lord. And so um, work with what you have and then be dedicated to it. Um, the dedication here that I want to talk to you about, and we learned this in, uh, in the uh, previous sermons, that whatever you do, you should do an excellent job at it. But I don't want you to understand that if, if you happen to suck at something and it wasn't excellent, then you shouldn't do it at all, because that is also a lie. I guarantee you, when you do something the very first, second, third, maybe fourth time, you're going to suck at it. It's not going to go well. You probably will mess up, and it's not going to be, like, perfect. But, like I said, it's better than not doing anything for the Lord. And then you build up through that dedication towards that good, excellent. Um, nobody does things excellent the first time. I guarantee you. Um, and so be dedicated. Be dedicated to... Um, things that you think are important, be dedicated um, to the things that perhaps are not that important, but to each of those things that you choose to do, uh, do it well. Um, and so the size of the task is not important, um, but that um, what matters is that it needs to be done and you're going to get it done. Um, and then you can work on the quality as you do it more and more. And so we are never too important to do menial things. And I still, you guys see me, I still mop the floor out in the cafe, and I still pick up trash around the church. And that's the same heart that I want all of you to have um, in our church, outside of our church, in your homes, in your families, at your school, everywhere that you go. That is a true heart of a, certain, uh, of a servant. Um, and so... Um, Number five, faithful to their ministry or faithful to your work. Faithfulness means uh, what? Faithfulness means when you do something, you finish what you're doing, finish the task. And if you are responsible for something, then you show up and you get it done. Um, if you made a promise or commitment, then you keep those promises and you keep those commitments. And I have to tell you that um, I am, uh, let's say, let's say I am very, um, I lack the patience. Let's say I lack the patience 
for people who don't keep commitments. And I realize why now, because I grew up in a Christian home, a Christian atmosphere, atmosphere, and you are taught to keep your word, keep your promises, and if you're responsible for something, you need to show up and you need to deliver and do what you're uh, do what you're, you're responsible for. But now that I understand, um, it ha actually helps me have more patience with people, is that not everybody grows up in that kind of environment. In fact, if you read Rick Warren's book, he says that um, a lot of people do not keep commitments, they don't show up, they don't call, um, they don't uh, keep their promises, they don't fulfill their responsibilities, just because they're not brought up to do that. Well, I tell you, the heart of a servant is we need to finish the job, never leave anything half done. Uh, we need to show up and we need to follow through on our responsibilities. Um, in the book, he says something that rings true with me because I've been serving for 25 years now in various different roles inside the church. He says that every Sunday morning, uh, num uh, you know, multitudes of church across the nation, someone has to improvise. Why? Because somebody did not show up. They did not show up. They did not even call. And so the people who are left have to pick up the pieces and fill in the gaps and improvise and uh, think f quick on their feet because people who are not faithful um, to their job and to their commitment and to their responsibility. And so I tell you, uh, you know, it's not just millennials, I found out now. It's not just millennials. It's actually people in general. If this not, if you're not um, committed, if you don't know and if you don't um, think that it's important, you're not going to keep commitments. And that's going to resonate throughout your life. You're not going to, you know, you change your mind. You tell them that you're going to be there, but then you change your mind. People do that a lot. You would be surprised. But as Christians, as people who follow Jesus Christ, if you say that you are going to show up, then you need to show up. If something emergency happens and you're unable to show up, then you should call and let them know or text them and let them know. That's the heart of a servant. That's faithfulness in practice. And then the last thing about faithful to ministry is I hope one day that, um, you know, when things are paid off and we're in a better place, um, then I will retire from my day job. Um, but in ministry, I want you to know something. You will never retire from serving God. Just put that in your mind now and set that as your commitment. And I told you guys, especially <clears throat> you guys that are <clears throat> experiencing very fast changing environments in your life, and it, you're going to experience that um, through college and through the first part of your career before you get settled, you're gonna experience a lot of changes. Make it work. Do number one, make yourself available. You can schedule, you can uh, pivot, you can do what it takes, um, but you are faithful. You do not quit. You do not give up on serving God. That is not the heart of a servant. The heart of a servant is we serve God. We dedicate our lives to the Lord. And we can't say one day, oh, Lord, let me have my life back. Because at this point in my life, I can't really serve you now. Maybe later. No, that's not how it works. Um, when you dedicate your life and um, through this series, you know, how God views your body, how you should view your body. Those of you who pray that you offered your body to the Lord as a living sacrifice, those are your words. God heard it, and he's going to keep you to it, and you should keep yourself to it. We do not retire from serving the Lord. And so that's what I want to um, convey to you this morning. If you don't remember anything, remember that. And then number six and the last one, keep a low profile. Real servants keep a low profile um, because why? Well, it could be bad for you if you don't. You know, there is something about people praising you that makes you become more and more, just a little bit more self-centered. Um, you know, in this world, that's how they uh, that's how they reward people. There's a hall of fame for almost everything. There's like a rock and roll hall of fame. There's like a, a, a listing of who's who's. There's like an encyclopedia. And if you're somebody, you're going to be listed in the encyclopedia. Even at my work, there's a, a program to recognize people who do outstanding jobs. There's probably like a parking space of the employee of the month. There's a lot of things in this world that kind of just recognize people um, for the great work that they're doing. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that is not um, 
how Jesus Christ chose to do it. Um, and so Paul actually exposed um, certain people among the early churches when he wrote in the book that they appear to be very spiritual because they're serving God, they're doing all these things within the church, but he said that in reality, <clears throat> they are just serving themselves. They're doing it for their own popularity, their own gain, or some kind of profit for themselves. He pointed it out and he said that you should not be like that. And so we serve for an audience of one. That is God himself. And if uh, God sees it, that's all you need. And God sees it. God sees everything that you do. And he sees your heart too when you do it and as you do it. And so uh, if we serve God, uh, we don't need to be recognized. Um, and this, would be, this should be an encouragement for you. Because sometimes we do do a lot of things. I know. Uh, a lot of people do a lot of things um, and inside the church. I know people serve outside the church, um, and they don't get, uh, nobody really knows what they do or how they do it. Um, but God knows everything. And God says, uh, God reassures us this way, that there will be a time, there will be a place when we stand before God that everything that we do, no matter how small and no matter how little, will be recognized and we will get rewarded for what we have done uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read this here. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. So if we help, if we serve, if we welcome a servant of God, it's like we are serving God himself. Um, that's what Jesus Christ is saying. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And so I want to tell you, and I want to conclude with this story. It's a true story from the autobiography of Reinhard Bonnke. Um, you know, he opens the book up and he describes what it's like to preach in front of millions of people at the same time. And Reinhard Bonnke started preaching in the continent of Africa in the 1970s, and he did not quit until um, he handed over the ministry to a younger gentleman named Daniel Kalenda in uh, the early 2000s. And so for all of those years that he preached um, and the numbers that they were able to track, 75 million people have received Jesus Christ um, and became uh, saved. That's not to mention all the other people in Africa that heard Jesus Christ but did not make a commitment and were not counted. And so basically by this one man, all of Africa, no matter in the big city or the little tiny little village, they would walk um, for miles to come here. Reinhard Bonnke, no matter if it was a closed nation because they were a Muslim nation, um, he sometimes got the, got the um, political connections to get invited into these Muslim countries where no other Christian could openly preach Jesus Christ. But he opens the book with what? Those of you who have I shared a link with, this will be a spoiler for you, but if you want to read it, um, let me know and I can share you the link. He opens up with a story of a man named Louis Graf, which nobody has ever heard of. Louis Graf was a German, uh, was a German businessman in America that was very um, that was very successful. And so after he was, uh, he, after he retired, he bought a car and he went back to Germany. This is during the 1920s to evangelize Germany. And so he drove his car um, all over Germany to preach Jesus Christ. And one day he got lost. He wanted to go to uh, another city, but he ended up in a very, very small town called Truns. And in that town, um, he spoke with a storekeeper and the storekeeper said, you don't need to preach Jesus around here. We're all Christians. We're all Lutheran. And if you're familiar with the Reformation, Martin Luther split away from the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so, and he was German. So almost all of Germany were Lutheran. But uh, Louis Graf wanted to preach Jesus Christ of the Bible, something that is perhaps different to them that they've never heard before. But uh, he said, okay, well, what if someone was miraculously healed? Do you think the people would listen to me then? And the storekeeper 
had a, I can imagine a sly smile on his face. And he said, sure, sure. If you heal somebody miraculously, we'll all listen. So uh, that's because he knew there was a very sick man in the village. And over 10 years, all the doctors could not do anything for him. They don't even know what he has, but he's in constant pain. And he uh, lays on the bed. He's bedridden for years. And so he said, sure, if you can heal him, we'll listen. And at that same time, the, the man, the sick man's son, rode a bicycle into the store. So he told Lewis Graff, son, take this man to your father. He's going to pray for him. So Lewis Graff uh, went there in his uh, slick, shiny automobile, and he went to this man named August Bonke. And he was truly really sick. Before he even stepped into the house, he heard the man screaming because every touch um, uh, put him in uh, even more crucial pain. Uh, he could not move. He could not do anything. He could not get out of bed. His wife had to take care of him completely. So he came in, and he said that today, in the name of Jesus Christ, you will be healed. The, the Lord will demonstrate his power for you today. He prayed for him. He took him by the hand. He pulled him up, and instantly, all the pain in his body left. And he was healed. He started walking around. He started jumping. He started running. And his wife, who has been had, had to take care of him for all these years, she just broke out in tears. And truly, like that man promised, the whole village sat down and listened to him preach Jesus Christ. But there was nobody who came during the calling to believe in Jesus except these two people that were healed. The only two people in the village um, were August Bonke and his wife, Marie Bonke. And that is the grandfather of uh, Reinhard Bonke. And so he said that God had placed that thread in his family line because of that one man who got lost because of God's divine appointment who put him in that little town at that right place, at that right time. And he ministered and he healed and he prayed and he healed for that one man. Now, all of Africa has heard Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus Christ was not making it sound pretty when he said that you will receive the, the reward of a prophet if you receive a prophet of the Lord. And that is truly how you can think of it in terms of how you serve God. It may be just one person's life that you get to tell um, or help them and tell them about Jesus Christ or one person's life that you get to influence or affect for Jesus Christ. But you don't know. You don't know the ramifications. You don't know 20 years, 60 years, 100 years from now where that life has led. And so Jesus Christ speaks the truth when he says that every little thing, even a cup of cold water that you give to the least which means the most unworthy, the most littlest, probably the one that is not so great, the least of his disciples, just that little cup of water. God takes it down. He writes it in his book. He's got it documented, and he will reward you for it because that is the kind of God that we serve, not in front of people. You're not going to get recognition probably in front of these people because I found out, just like I told you a couple of weeks ago, all the recognition that I got in this world, whether it be a certificate of something, something, a plaque or uh, a trophy, they're just things. You can't bring it with you when you die. Um, and most of the paper certificates that I have, I don't even know what happened to it. Uh, it, get lo it got lost in the move. God's really going to reward you in a place where you can keep that reward forever. And you'll always have that reward. When we all stand in front of God on the day of judgment, we will not be judged as one with non-believers. In fact, everything that we have done, everything that God has given us, and everything, every choice that we've uh, chosen to do with the ability, the time, the life, the energy that God has given us, God will reward us. And we will keep that reward. We will be um, recognized in front of all people. All people who have done things that people don't even realize, taken care of the sick, um, um, uh, taken care of the elderly, um, all the things that we have done because uh, of God, because God wants us to serve others. 
we will be recognized in front of the entire uh, world, not just your company or, or your church. Um, we will be recognized in front of the entire world because God will reward us, and we get to keep that reward in eternity where it's not going to get lost in the move. Everyone, please stand up. And this morning, um, I want to bring back the altar call. I was convicted in my heart. I say, God, you know, there's really no new people uh, in our sanctuary, but I want to be obedient. And so every Sunday when I deliver a message, I will call. And so uh, everyone close your eyes and bow your heads. And if this morning the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and you have not made a decision in your life, for Jesus Christ, to believe in him, to trust in him, to invite him into your heart as Lord and Savior, and you want to do that now, please raise your hand, and I will help you pray. And for those of you, I've been praying, in fact, I've been praying for over a year that the Holy Spirit engage your heart and mind and call you into serving God. There are so many things to do um, to build up the, the church of God here. There are a lot of things that God wants to bring into your life by divine appointment and uh, it's for you to um, serve God. And those are all opportunities. They're not um, things that we have to do. They're the things that we get to do for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray that the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart this morning and calls you to submit yourself to becoming a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, because you are an awesome God. And for you, you set us apart because you are holy and you are set apart, God. We don't work according to the ways of the world. We don't strive for things things that decay and pass away, God. We strive to serve you. We strive to honor you. We strive to glorify you. We strive to serve, God, because that's who you are. You are a servant, God, and you want us to serve others, God. Jesus Christ, I pray um, I pray that you, uh, you yourself uh, call um, the po pastors, prophets, evangelists, God, and you equip them uh, to serve in your church, God. And Holy Spirit, I, pr I pray that you call each and every uh, believer, every member of this congregation, of this church, God, to a service, to a ministry, to, uh, to things that are needed, God, to... Um, uh, in your ministry, in your work, God, in this household, in the church, God, and outside of these doors, in their lives, God. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you train all of us up, God, to be good and faithful servants, to be mighty warriors in the army of Jesus Christ, God, to get things done and be faithful to the end, God, so that we can um, finish our race, so we can um, uh, meet you uh, with a job well done, uh, our Lord and Savior, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's sing. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship. forgiveness and grace of Jesus Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we see you again face to face. Amen. And after next week's sermon, uh, leadership team and everyone else who wants to be involved, we're going to do a uh, group huddle. We're going to take the things that we learned and we're going to get back on track. <laughs>